I'm not sure this morning um, that I'll have you turn to a specific scripture. There are a lot I'm going to refer to. Um, so let me introduce what I want to try to do today. We've been talking about what the Bible reveals about God. One of the core things we've not dealt with yet, but we have dealt with, God's nature as holy love, and then this holy loving God is all-powerful, all-knowing, everywhere present. He is merciful and kind. He is good. He is just. He is a judge. He is perfect in all of his ways. He's eternal. He is unending. He's unchanging. All of these things have not yet touched on or assume, maybe we could say, that God eternally exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The issue of the Trinity. Now, I want to just be as clear with you as I can. Maybe exaggerate a little bit, I don't know, I never do that, but if there's ever a time when you've been participants in the blind leading the blind, it will be today. Now, I'm not saying that you are blind, okay? But I'm telling you, um, there's no more necessary subject, true subject, foundational subject, but that God is eternally existent in three persons. Yet, there is no subject like that more difficult to grasp. Now, we are today gathered here as finite people trying to get our arms around something that's infinite. So, keeping that in mind, we have some idea of how difficult it is to get a hold of this. Yet, we have to at least as much as we can. Now, the Bible everywhere speaks that God is one. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6, the Lord, our God, is one God. Now, would you think with me? Those very words... Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The word Lord is singular. The word God is plural. In the beginning, the only scripture that I have open here for me is Genesis 1. In the beginning, God, that word, is plural. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The next verse is rev referring to someone else. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void. The darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. That's another, that's otherness. And then, verse 3, and God said. That's the word. Now, granted, we're able through the lens of the New Testament, and especially John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We can look through that lens with that light and see 
the three persons of the Trinity here in the first three verses of the Bible. God the Father, maker of heaven and earth, the Apostles' Creed says. The Spirit of God brooded over the surface of the waters. And God spoke. And He said, that's the word. Then you have an even more intriguing verse still in chapter 1 of Genesis, after all the creation except for man. And I know that that's an oppressive, a non-inclusive word <clears throat> when I say mankind. But, when all the creation except for mankind was concluded, then you have... <clears throat> These words. Then God said, Let us make man in our image. He did not say, I will now make man in my image. He said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness. And that's repeated couple chapters later. So we begin right off the bat, whether we can understand it or not, we get the idea of oneness that somehow includes otherness. Now, one of the reasons that we, by our fingernails, can get a hold of why there's a trinity is first of all we have lots of raw material we have plenty of places in scripture where the the bible talks about the father the son and the spirit if you take the just the old testament is has a number surprising number of references to god the son um Psalm 110, David says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit on your throne ruling the earth. Well, you have two people there. The Lord said to David, My Lord, and that Lord is Jesus. It's used in the New Testament for Christ. There's all kinds of raw material but one of the foundational ways we can somehow get a hold of three persons is, number one, we know God is love. He is self-giving love. That's everywhere in the scripture too. A single person cannot, you cannot love if there's nobody else there. You have to have otherness for there to be love because love is by its nature outflowing. It is self-communicating, self-giving. Now, obviously we could be here for two days. Well, I could, <laughs> you wouldn't. Looking at all the words that have been wrecked, and love is one of them. And love, typically with sin, love has been 180 degree reversed. So that love, in our minds, is self-pleasing. So I reach out to an object because of what that object can do for me. Okay? Okay? God's love and the original love and the pattern for our love is a love that reaches out for what I can do for the object. That's God's love. That's the pattern that he says, I want you to live by. Not what the world calls love. 
but the kind of love that is not dependent on the lovableness of the object. Does that make any sense? That's what Jesus was talking about when he said the Father is kind to the thankful and the unthankful. And he sends the rain on the just and on the unjust. You be perfect like your Father's perfect. And he just got done talking about don't only wave at your neighbors or invite people to your house that are capable of inviting you to their house. Reciprocate. Invite those who can't. That's God's love. It's virtually lost. That concept is virtually lost. Now, so God, this is all we know. We, I can't some ways reason it out completely, but God had no beginning. But from all of eternity, the Son proceeded, that's a word we use, from the nature of the Father. The Father, the Father can't love unless He has an object to love. No one can love unless they have an object to love. And the Spirit of God proceeds from both the Son and from the Father in a unity and fellowship of self-giving and receiving and giving back love. That's the atmosphere in which the three persons of the Trinity exist. We Again, you, no one, even God, is not totally, independently one, or you can't have love. I have to have an object. And God existed, we don't, well, from the beginning, until he created mankind. But he existed in perfect, self-sufficient unity for all that time. Because he, and he needed no fellowship outside of that. Because the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, and that love between the two of them is the Spirit. I can't go much further than that. Um, it, again, it is... It's difficult to understand the core of it, but we can look at how it works, how the three persons of the Godhead function. There's even what's called two kinds of doctrines or two separate um, ways of looking. There's, there's the eternal trinity, which is the core issue of the three persons dwelling in perfect unity. And then there's what's called, and I'm not too sure why, what the word is, it doesn't even do with finances, but it's called the economic trinity. It's the way the trinity works in ways that humans can see. I can't get the first part. It's hard for me to grasp the eternal trinity. But I can see the functional trinity. The Father sent the Son to die. The Holy Spirit draws our hearts through the Son to the Father. The Father forgives me for what the Son has done on my behalf and sends the Holy Spirit to put it into effect in my heart. We can figure out as we can describe the Trinity a little bit better than we can define it and understand it. Now, there's people way, way, way smarter than I am that can come closer to defining it. But, here's the issue. The Bible seems to make clear that God, in a, a privilege that we can't describe, seeks to have something like, it can't be totally the same, but He seeks to have something like the unity and fellowship that the three persons of the Trinity enjoy with us. So he wants, 
he seeks a similar relationship with us that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit enjoy among that three. Okay? Everybody completely lost? <clears throat> we'll either get out real early or really late today. <clears throat> There are two characteristics of the, the just two, there's, there's about eight, but I want to just look at two. Characteristics of the unity that the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son have within the Trinity that God wants to have a like, likeness in relationship with us. Okay? Two characteristics. One, it's self-giving love. Not the selfish kind that this world knows. That's sin. That's what happened when sin came into the world. Now, nothing about the devil or sin or anything is original. All sin is, is perversion of what God's already made. So the devil doesn't really create. He just wrecks what God created. Self-giving love has been completely then turned in on ourselves and that's the number one problem with the human race I love myself supremely I love my way I love my opinions I love my feelings I love whatever it is about myself I sure love it okay and the ultimate person the ultimate person who is a threat to that self-love is the God who says, you love me, Jesus said. I, I'm, I've been struck, well, a lot of times, with how much we don't pay attention to the Bible. Jesus said a lot of things that I, I tell you somehow they just go over, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the inerrancy of the Bible, I tell you what. No, we don't. Jesus said, if you don't love me more than your money, more than your mom and your dad, more than your children, more than your reputation, more than all your possessions, in fact, he said, if you don't love me more than your own life, you can't be my disciple. Now, he didn't say, you can't be a gold star champion Christian, you can be this kind of a Christian, but not that. He didn't say that. He said, you can't even get in on the kindergarten virgin version of Christianity as a basic disciple. Man! Does that mean anything to us? When God came, He required, you have the same kind of self emptying love that I have or just kind of don't bother the second thing that's within the three persons of the Trinity and then we'll move on so several of us here have already entered into rest <clears throat> perfect freedom the three persons of the Trinity are exist in perfect freedom meaning there's nothing compelled of the other one now why do we say that because if and i know jesus prayed in the garden not my will but thine be done but that was totally free he decided and he said that he said nobody takes my life from me but I lay it down of myself, and he said, if I lay it down, I take it up. Okay? What does that mean? It means that Jesus was agreeing freely to the will of the Father that he die for us. But it was not compelled. What do we mean by that? If he was forced to die it wasn't then free on his part and therefore his death was merely the death let's say of a martyr 
but not with merit. The only reason that gives Jesus life and death merit on my behalf when I say I trust in Jesus, Father, as a covering for the sins I've committed, is the fact that he gave his life voluntarily. Now, I know we wouldn't have had redemption if he hadn't done it. But it's voluntarily, which is why he requires voluntary love and obedience from us. And any relationship on the horizontal level that is, has any meaning at all has to have the freedom aspect. This is what's so in, but the world's crazy. But this is what is so insane about lots and lots of marriages. It is... I won't let you leave. And in some cases, lock the, you know, um, force them to stay. Stalk them. Won't let them get away. Are you a maroon? (laughs) Do you really want somebody that doesn't voluntarily, voluntarily love you? Does that have any meaning? But that's how nuts sin is has made us with the this kind of love, not that kind. And so, we, even in some theologies, we make God out as a predestinator. You will love me, you will be saved, and it's irresistible. I wouldn't serve a God like that. But thankfully, our God's never even thought of something that crazy. He dwells in voluntary, self-giving love. And that's how he treats us. Why? Because he said, let us make a man in our image and our likeness. So that's what he wants of us back to him now <clears throat> he has given several there's several metaphors if you want to say of the relationship that God wants with us that is also somewhat helps us in understanding the relationship the three persons have <clears throat> by the way i don't want to forget this up probably touch on it a second we're in the Christmas season this is what sets Christianity of course totally apart from the only other two uh, there's three called monotheistic religions Christianity Judaism and Islam every other religion is poly you know many 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 gods but there's only one God that is a unity but also with difference and otherness, and that's the Trinity. The word Trinity doesn't even appear in the Bible, but it's everywhere. Jesus said, you go baptize, make disciples, and what? Baptize them, and even the language, baptize them not in the names, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have that great benediction that we'll use from time to time. <clears throat> the love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and so forth. The benedictions that you have in both old and new. The priest would give that benediction. <clears throat> the Lord make his face shine upon you, give you peace, lift up his countenance upon you bless you, and so forth. Three blessings in that. Everywhere we go through Scripture, we find the raw material which the New Testament church, after the death of the apostles, took about 400 years to try to figure it out. Now, I don't mean that it was... 
They didn't fight over what it was. They were just trying to describe how can we, how can we keep three persons which are clearly the Holy Spirit has received worship and is prayed to and is spoken of in the Scriptures, God. The Son is worshipped, prayed to, has all the attributes of Godness. The Father, prayed to, worshipped, all the attributes of Godness. What in the world do you do with that? It took about 350 or 400 years to figure all that out. And put it in a way that avoided error. And there have been lots of errors. One called tritheism. We have kind of three separate gods. That's, that got rejected. There's another one that is called modalism, which is there's only one God. But in it, the word comes from the Greek plays, the theater, where they would, you'd have one actor, but he'd change masks. And so he would be the good guy, and then he'd go off, and then he'd change or put a different mask on and come back out, and he'd be the bad guy. But he played the different parts. And so the idea is we really only have one, one person, but he just shows up as different persons through history, which we know that's not true. Finally, we've done the best we could to come up with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three, yet one. One in, in essence, who they're being. One in eternity. One in equality. You cannot have what's even called a hierarchy. Where you have, there's, I won't get into that. But you just don't. It isn't that the Father um, carries all the weight and the Son and the Holy Spirit somehow are step and fetch it boys for the Father. That's another error that you can't have. It's very hard. However, what we can understand is what we need to focus on. There are then these three relationships that God wants to have with us that technically are, are found, I'll just look at two for today, are found within the Trinity. One is familial. Jesus came to this earth and couldn't have come, by the way, on that first Christmas in, in clothed in human flesh if there weren't a trinity. A single God with no, pers- no three persons can't be incarnated. I have to have the Son who does the bidding of the Father voluntarily to come here and be enfleshed in humanity in order to save us. There's then the, the family idea. Every one of us got here from two other people. No one that, that I'm aware of got here without two other people. Okay? And the concept then of origin and of life that is given Jesus talked about he said I have I do not have life in myself the life I have is from the father and the spirit gives life there is a sense then in which the idea of family is an illustration of the family that God wants us to be a part of a spiritual family there's the, a second, deeper, more intimate kind of metaphor that God uses, wants us to be in the same kind of relationship, and that's marriage. He wants us to have a relationship similar to, illustrated by what he gave us in He made us to be one with stark difference, male and female. And those two joined are one. And that's the illustration Jesus uses for the church. 
we are the bride of Christ. The Old Testament, though, is full of talking about Israel as being God's wife. He said, I've called you as a wife that's f- forsaken. I have struck out after you, after you've left me. And what does God call, both Old and New Testament? This is a frequent statement. What does he call sinning against him? Adultery. You can't have adultery unless you've got a model of marriage. So to, here's the thought that I've this been on my mind. As sacred, as precious, as holy, as God has elevated these relationships, family and then marriage, how awful it is then to destroy the symbol, the illustration. We're so far in this world in general, talking to, well, it doesn't matter whether it's law enforcement or poor teachers. Everybody, it seems like, the people who come from a normal, decent, loving protective, secure family are scarce as hen's teeth. That's an old Indiana statement. Look what has happened and what do we do to the most sacred illustrations that God could come up with and we destroy them. In a marriage, then, Paul says, Ephesians 5, he says, in the beginning, God created male and female, says, and they two shall become one flesh. And he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the church. In the same way, then, as believers, we join together with God and become one in him like he expects a marriage to be. And a marriage, again, is to reflect. That's that's also why Paul said, Husbands, you love your wives like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. What is that? Gave himself for his bride. What is that? It's, I want what I want when I'm going to, I want my way and I'm (laughs) not... That's what I think, frankly, after 45 years of being in marriage counseling. That is 180 degrees opposite of anything to do with God. You know that? That felt kind of good. There have, well, I got to keep going. I got seven minutes and I sinned greatly last Sunday. So, but listen, when, when God, you know, it's like the, something I said earlier about the, being a disciple. You know what God has a really bad habit of? He tends to mean what he says. You know that? Frankly, we don't. Starting in Adam, and the, he said, "You'll die. You eat. You eat of that. You'll die." Ah, oh, no, I didn't. I didn't mean it. Yeah, I did. When Jesus said, "You love me more than your life," or you can't even be my disciple. Well, I know he doesn't mean that. When he said, "Husbands, you love your wives like Christ loved the church." Well, I, uh, wives, you reverence your husbands and you love and support them. Well, I'll hear that. That's all we do. You know what? We either 
as so-called Bible-believing people need to stop telling that lie or we better start living it. He meant it. Paul told, or Peter, Peter wrote, he said, Husbands, you be kind and gentle and good to your wives. He said, or your prayers will be cut off. That's a Greek word there. It says, King James says, your prayers will be hindered. That's a bad word because it's about half strength. The Greek word is to, it's a military term that means to cut a deep trench, like a tank trench in World War II or I, across a road so that it stops traffic. And that's the word he used. He said, if, you, if you're bitter toward her, you're harsh toward her, he said, I won't listen to your prayers. They'll be cut off. Don't be jabbing her at me. I'm not going to listen to you. I don't want to stand before God in that kind of condition. God pays attention to all of these relationships that are illustrative of His relationship among the Trinity. From the Trinity, then, flows all of our teaching and all of our relationship models that's why the trinity though it's so hard to grasp is the core of our you deny the trinity you're not a christian and it you you can't have salvation you can't have the incarnation you can't have the death and resurrection and the atonement you can't have anything i have to have the trinity it's difficult when something is so critical that is difficult to grasp. But God told us everywhere that there's a person called the Father, a person, the Son, a person, the Holy Spirit, yet they are one. Now, I'll quit. There's an awful lot <clears throat> yet to say. <clears throat> but I want us to do what the early church clearly did before the word Trinity was even come up with. I believe under the direction of the Holy Spirit as the early church grappled with how to explain this in spite of their inability to understand it, not even having the word Trinity yet, they believed it. They prayed to God the Father through Jesus Christ, aided by the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Father's scepter that the king extends to those who he welcomes. And I, that's why Jesus said, you can't come to the Father unless you come through me. There is no other way. I know people say, well, there are a lot of ways to heaven. No, there's not. There's one. It's through Jesus Christ. Jesus is my advocate. He's the one who ushers me into the presence of the Father and gives me an audience but Jesus is also the one that says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Remember Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, I don't need to. You've seen me. Last thought. I've got to quit. And I know this is a stretch. And we look at ourselves and we think, how in the world could we ever measure up? But 1 John, then, there's the Father, I've never seen the Father, but I've seen the Son. Yet Jesus said, if you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father. And then 1 John says, each and every one of us are supposed to be little Jesuses, little Christs. The word there is the word from which we get the word facsimile. We're to be, so God's plan is to have millions of Christians 
who look like Jesus, so if they've seen him, they've seen the Father. That's his evangelism program. What are we doing to either aid it or hinder it? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, this is an impossible subject really for us to try to grapple with. It doesn't mean I have any trouble or any of us in believing it because you said it. And you've given us just enough of an outline that we can get a hold of a few things. But Lord, I, I pray that you would make us aware somehow of the depth and the richness of what you have for us, what you call us to, and what you're able to change us into. You wouldn't require or call or exhort us to something not livable. You can change our hearts, and we know, Lord, that while we have this sense in our hearts of what we ought to be, we're always falling short because we're trying to do it without the transforming, abiding power of your Spirit. So Lord, I pray that you would make us, help us somehow get serious, especially in this day of nonsense. So Lord, help us think on these things. And as it says of Mary, she pondered them in her heart. Lord, help us walk in your light. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.